Good morning. It's still morning, right? Yep. <laughs> right. It just barely is. Um, okay. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Janine Collins, and I I wear several hats. Um, I am a, a parent of Michael and Julia, age nine and five. Um, I've been an educator in the Clark County School District and um, an adjunct uh, an adjunct at the University of Nevada Las Vegas Department of Fine Arts, and I currently sit as the Chief Community Innovation Officer with Ed Extraordinary, a small organization um, in Las Vegas that focuses on learning and development research and education. And I'm so happy to be one of your facilitators today. And I would love to introduce my, uh, or allow or invite my co-facilitator to introduce herself as well. So my name is Rebecca Dirks Garcia. I am a parent education advocate. I am the immediate past president in Nevada PTA as of last week. So it's fresh after um, surviving three years. I say surviving because I did it over the pandemic. Um, <laughs> for three years um, as the president, I'm also engaged in a number of different councils and committees and um, I'll run a large community online for parents and educators in Clark County. I'm the mom of four amazing neurodiverse kids, ages 27 to 11. So I have three currently enrolled in three different schools um, and excited to be talking with all of you today about this important topic and glad you're taking time out of your Saturday to be with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, as we're about to get started, uh, I'd like to invite you to be thinking about the hat that you are wearing to today's conversation. Many of us wear multiple hats uh, as community members, as parents um, and family members, as people um, inside our jobs, um, and certainly as educators too. And so I would just invite you to type into the chat as you're introducing yourself, what hat or hats you really feel you're gonna be wearing into this conversation today. So for example, well, I'm going to write facilitator, uh, but I might I might write parent um, or I might write teacher or I might write advocate. Um, what hat or hats are you bringing to this conversation today? And I think one of the things Janine um, said is really important. Almost none of us just wear one um, in life. That's very rare. And so understanding how those different hats impact what we bring to conversations, I think is important for us to get more out of the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. So today's session is, is titled Defining Success by Imagining the Future, Building a Portrait of a Nevada Learner Together. Um, the organization that I sit with at Extraordinary is one of a uh, few partners working with the Nevada Department of Education in a new uh, Future of Learning initiative. And today's session is designed to kind of think about it from whatever hat you're wearing, but also to really be intentional as we think about how we might engage families uh, effectively in, in this conversation. And so our learning intentions for today are to give us uh, an opportunity to consider more deeply who young people um, can be and why, to learn a little bit about the portrait of an Nevada learner process, what it is and what it could mean for education moving forward, and then to really spend some time considering the important role that families need to play in evolving this work. And so as we begin, I would love to invite you to pause and to consider the question, um, who do you want young people to be and why? And we'd invite you to take a moment to reflect and to bring that into the chat. Who do you want young people to be and why? A word, a phrase, what comes to mind? This one I think is sometimes hard. As a parent of four very different kids, I always think that each path is gonna be unique, right? What one child may do may not be what another child does. And so for me, I always think about who do I want them to be in the end goal after education is done? And that's that they, they're able to make the choice they want for their life. Um, and I love Rochelle, authentic learner. I like that. That's a great, mentally strong and thoughtful. Caring, positive contributor to society, thinking about the greater good. 
interesting how much we're thinking about who we want them to be as individuals, not necessarily a degree or a job. But if, I love that effective learner capable of critical thinking. Responsible, happy. respectful, happy. Mm -hmm. I love all that feedback because that's true, right? Those are and, and how many of you look at that chat are saying, yep, I definitely agree. That's that's something that I want for the kids I know and the kids maybe that are yours. Um, the, the, there's the shared link of what we want for kids at the end of the day. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I love I love this feedback because though that question and the way that we think about that question. Uh, is something that the department um, is seeking to really infuse into the way that we think about um, what school can be and what learning can look like moving ahead. And so this slide is just sort of a, a quick introduction to what is uh, going to be starting to launch next week. You're getting preview, which is called the Nevada Future of Learning Network. And the hope is that through um, a process of envisioning in our community, uh, working with schools and at the school level, working closely with young people and families, um, we can continue to evolve education so that at the school and district level and even at the state level with policy, we're able to support bringing the values of um, learning and who we want young people to be um, and who they want to be to life. And the process of getting clear on how we might help evolve education to do that um, is uh, in developing a portrait of a Nevada learner. Um, so what is a portrait of a learner? Uh, it's essentially a North Star. It's a, it's a vision statement that clearly describes the values and the attributes that a community believes are important for young people to have to succeed in learning and in life. And it's really being created in response to the recognition that uh, the future is rapidly evolving, uh, that the needs and the, uh, the needs of young people and our school systems um, need to be addressed and continually uh, uh, rethought of in conversation with community so that we are being as relevant and effective as possible in what we do. Um, systems create a portrait often because they recognize the need to get clear on what needs to be true. And they also recognize that maybe there's not enough full alignment with the way things are and where people want to be. And so a portrait helps us quite easily, quite frankly, get clear on that. Um, and, and as we and as I kind of alluded to, um, we know more than ever technology, we're more rapidly connected than we ever were before. How can uh, what we do evolve so that learners are really able to be the things that you said in the, the chat, true lifelong learners, authentic learners, happy contributors to society. Um, in many ways, the reason we need a portrait is to make clear the things that you all said at the beginning of this process. Um, so really, a portrait can also help us maintain a clear direction for how we move education forward together. Um, it ensures that we're thinking not only about college, um, but career readiness and learning in the workforce, human skills, often called soft skills, that are really critically important um, for employability, but also navigating the unknown. And another thing that it does is it like frames the whole conversation about what's happening in education in a way that gives us an opportunity to keep driving back to that North Star. Um, and one of the things I really love as a parent and an educator is the idea that a portrait that calls in these really important human values, values that you described, invites us to help um, collect evidence of how learners are that, and not just if they are smart in, in some ways, but how they are smart in multiple ways. Um, and so I think that's a really exciting thing that can happen um, when we do that. Rebecca, is there anything you'd like to add at this point? Um, before we move on to looking at some examples? Well, I think that one of the things that's also important is that shared community vision. So often we talk about things, but we don't have shared terminology and language in order to move from point A to point B. And that's a disconnect that I see so frequently between families and educators is not that they don't want the same things, 
is that they're not using the same language and understanding what each other means in the process. And that's one of the areas where I think a portrait can really help our community get to a shared understanding where we have a common framework to start conversations from that lead to a deeper understanding of how we can move the needle for kids. Yeah, I love that. And I think those sometimes those disconnects can happen at all layers of the system too. And so to continue to have that shared language, that shared vision, and the shared understanding of what it actually can mean, and having young people be a part of that process too, to, sh to, to be able to articulate that is really, um, is really a beautiful opportunity. We wanted to give you a couple of examples of what some portraits look like. It's like, okay, a portrait a picture, a vision, a North Star, like what are some of these, what, 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 what portraits exist in the world related to this? And so there are definitely, this isn't a, a totally new initiative. There are many states, there are some states and many districts that have actually embarked on the process of creating a portrait or a profile of a learner or of a graduate. And in Nevada, we just decided to use the term uh, learner um, because I think it was really important to really the State Department to recognize that they wanted to have a big conversation about what it would look like to learn across a lifespan and not just to graduate high school. What does it really mean to be a learner across a lifespan? And the term portrait was really decided because we wanted to recognize that different people look at and interpret a portrait in different ways. And so how can we really call in multiple perspectives when we are doing this work? And so you'll see Virginia is one of the early adopters of this work and kind of the early 2000s. And uh, the kinds of things that they called into their portrait were they addressed content knowledge that they felt was important, workplace skills, community engagement, um, careers. And you'll see here at the bottom, critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. That's actually the five C's of their portrait that bring these values to life. Another set of options um, from a neighbor close by in Utah that recently built theirs um, was that they kind of came up with five or so themes in a couple of categories. And so they were really looking at like the buckets of academic mastery being important, but also wellness. Um, also the ways in which people can engage in civic life. And then in through their conversations, they really thought it was critically important that young people have a sense of being able to engage with the world digitally. So really calling in technology and digital skills as critical. You'll notice down here that some of those same C's, uh, often called 21st century skills, came up in their portrait as really important in terms of collaboration, communication, um, creativity, uh, recognizing that it's not enough just to learn things, but it's really, we need to start focusing on how we apply and how learning um, and what we know and who we are can come alive uh, in our school experiences. And their overall vision that sort of captures that uh, is over here, um, it's on my right side of the screen, um, but these key sort of like um, values in a, in a learner. I think what's interesting about this is that it's showing us there's not just one way to build a portrait. Um, these two are much more similar. Uh, these two are, 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 well, let's look at North Dakota is really simple. <laughs> um, they have a couple of key values and they're actually, I think, in a process where they're even getting clear about what those values mean. Over here, if you look at Vermont's portrait, they also had six clear values and then they started to define what those values look like um, and what they could mean in a classroom setting. Um, and so I think as we think about that, it's also really important to know that there are people in our own state and communities in our own state who've embarked around this, uh, embarked on this work. And so um, if you know Superintendent Summer Stevens in Churchill County, she has been instrumental in leading her uh, community through a similar set of conversations. And these are the values that they came up with. And so, um, the, the task is as they've been able to, as Rebecca said, get have the shared conversation, have these shared values about why, who we need to be as a result of coming together in school. What does that start to mean about change in classrooms? What might, might, might that alter about the way we're learning and teaching, about the way that we assess learners, about the way that we communicate about skills and what young people are capable of? And, um, I, yes, so I just wanted to also show you that there is some work happening in our state right now that we can also draw from. And so 
I wanted to provide one more piece of research for you. Um, some of the terms and the words that you're seeing um, look an awful lot like what we all know to be soft skills. And an organization called America Succeeds has done some research. I think they looked at like 80 million job descriptions over the past two years. And these were the top 10 of uh, skills that they saw across job postings in the United States. And this durable skills wheel, which you can access more about at this link below, is a kind of like a really robust, a really big portrait of like, what are the kinds of skills we, that are being looked for in the workplace and in industry? And so I think it's really interesting to see that people in communities are using similar words, sometimes different words, but there seems to be a recognition of how might we really get clear that these kinds of things really matter to us and for us um, and for our learners. And so I just think I'd like to pause and create a space for some dialogue uh, to you know, invite Rebecca to take any clarifying deeper questions in the chat um, and take a few moments to sort of discuss what resonates with us about maybe embarking on a conversation like this and what else might emerge that we'd like to name. And we um, shared also in the chat some links for later. Feel free to share those or save those so you can look at um, some additional content, including about what Churchill has done. If you haven't seen what Dr. Stevens has done, there's some great work happening there. But what are your thoughts as you think of this? How do you how do you see this impacting us in Nevada, or how do you maybe think we need to consider as we move forward in the work? Any thoughts, feel free to put them in on, in the chat. If you wanna unmute, we're well, we like feedback. Janine and I don't need, we talk to each other a lot. Yes, Rochelle. Hi, I, I am so excited uh, about listening to what you guys just talked about. Um, I, I think it's, it's so on time with families and schools being bombarded with mm -hmm. outside voices of what we should teach, what we shouldn't teach, things of that nature. I love the fact that you mentioned to, to not just a graduate, but like a lifelong learner. What do we want mm -hmm. our Nevada students to walk away with? I, my husband is in an in applied technology field and he's seeing more and more individuals that come. They may have book knowledge, but they don't have applicable knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so, have being able to think critically and have that applicable knowledge. And when I said authentic, it's not just swallowing everything whole, but just thinking yeah. critically and, mm -hmm. and, and, and processing the way you individually process. Um, so I'm just excited that there will be a portrait, a blueprint, something out there that says when a Nevada student finishes high school, they're walking out with with technical skills with soft skills to be able to relate because those of, of you that have been in education for more than 10 years you're seeing a trend at least i am and i've been in for 40 years that's scaring the bejeebies out of me and i think as uh, educators we need to take our role back we need to have mm. something across the board that says this is what education looks like instead of everybody from God knows where dictating to us what education should look like in the end. That's my soapbox. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that <laughs> so much because what you said is so true, right? I think any of us who've sat in the education space for any length of time in the last couple of years have felt that I'll just say exhaustion and I'm on the parent side. I'm not a licensed educator at all, but I still feel that same way that it's like all these voices and all these people telling me what we should or shouldn't think or do or experience. And it's like, how do we get back to what matters, which is the learner, right? Like, what do we want? Um, I am a PTA person. And so like our mission and values are that we want every child to reach their full potential. So for me, that's how I see this. Like, how do we say, how do what do all kids need in order to be able to reach their full potential at the end of the day when they leave our systems our classrooms our communities 
how do they have that? And I love what you shared with that. Did anybody else want to share? I saw a comment in the chat about um, less rote learning, more applied, right? And, and I think that is really important. Anybody else want to share a thought? I know as Janine was speaking and sharing, um, I thought yesterday, so I work in a nonprofit and the community impact director for a workforce development program in Southern Nevada. And I was creating job descriptions and reviewing job descriptions and creating a workforce learning program that I'll be delivering next week um, with the housing authority here in town. And it's all of these things that we're looking for of how to instill. And if they don't get them in the first step, then we're trying to figure out how to backfill. So how do, how do we not have that disconnect, I think is a huge conversation of how this fits into a broader community and how it's not just about educators, it's not just about parents, it's about how all the stakeholders have a voice in what we want to be true for our kids. And with that, I'll hand it back to Janine. Yeah, I love your insights. I'll, I, I love and appreciate these insights because yes, it really is about having that uh, a really community owned conversation um, and vision for the future. Um, and we thought it might be fun to take you through an opportunity to share your feedback with us as we get ready to launch this work. And for also us to kind of think about what it might look like to embody a conversation. So um, basically I have a video, we have a video for you. <laughs> and while you're watching this video and fingers crossed it works, we did a test run. I think, I think we're in good shape. Um, but some of it, there's, you know, we think about, I was doing research for this work and my daughter is a kindergartner and there's projected lifespan, projected lifespans for kindergartners are between 100 and 110 years. And so when we think about what somebody put in the chat, lifelong learning, like learning over a hundred years of technological innovation, of jobs changing and evolving and interests evolving, like what does it really mean to prepare people for the task of being a lifelong learner now? And um, technology is always one of our go-tos, right? Like we know that technology is greatly impacting the way that we think about jobs and tasks and also what it means to be a human being. Right? What, what are the kinds of things that technology would never be able to do? What makes a human special? So I'm going to invite you to think about that and to also think about what could be in a world where technology is positive, is enhancing our lives. Um, what excites you and what's unsettling perhaps. Um, so as you watch this video for the next three minutes, I would love for you just to be able to take some individual notes and don't you worry, um, afterwards we'll have an opportunity to process in a small group as well. Here we go. Okay, that might be where we get to. So um, we, we got there. I think it's the wind, everybody, to be honest with you. So driverless vehicles, I, I think you, uh, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to actually get into a group in a moment and just kind of process 
hey, a world in which technology is, is, is enhancing our lives, is making tasks that have often been done by humans more efficient and maybe not being able, needing to use humans in that way anymore. What makes a human special? What is timeless about being a human? And what are some of the possibilities um, uh, of a world like that? So that's gonna be our first five minutes. Um, we're gonna be in small groups of three. The second five minutes are, I, we would love for you to bridge so what are the top three mindsets and skills that your group thinks might be critical to empower future ready learners? So we're gonna start with those first five minutes, just sort of reflecting on the concept uh, that the video was inviting us to think about. And then the second five minutes um, coming together around three shared mindsets or skills or um, that you feel are really important. And those can be words or phrases. Are there um, any clarifying questions about what we're going to do over the next 10 minutes? Great. I think Rebecca and I are going to be able to hop around, I hope. Um, and we look forward to coming in and out of your conversations. Feel free to um, not include us or include us if it makes sense. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, Welcome, welcome. I know our group was having some great conversations. So sorry to interrupt um, the conversation because they, uh, I always hate doing that when you've got a good flow and then you're like, oh, but now you got to go back and share. Um, <laughs> so, um, but hopefully that little tidbit gave some good opportunity. And we want you now to um, think about that question of what do you think are the top three mindsets and skills? Although I'm going to edit that a tiny bit because when you have to think of the top ones, sometimes suddenly you get a little paralyzed because you <laughs> want to think of the most important. Um, this is really a brainstorming opportunity. So don't feel like it's the only three that could ever be considered <laughs> that you think are important. Um, think of those and then start typing them in the chat. And then we will give a count of one, two, three, go, and then ask you to hit enter. So this is something I've not done before. Janine had this beautiful idea. I'm guessing educators do it more than I do. I have never done it, um, but I love it. So open up your chat, think of three things, but don't hit enter until I say one, two, three, go. Okay, Does most people have their three things. While we're typing, I'll just add that this strategy emerged for me during the pandemic because it was a great way to make sure that people had an opportunity to share their idea without necessarily feeling like they had to jump on board with somebody else's idea. And so we love the opportunity to give people the chance to really be individuals with their voice um, and to do it kind of almost in an unbiased way. Um, also, when you click enter and Rebecca cues you, it's really fun to watch it populate like a waterfall. Um, that's just an added bonus. <laughs> it's exciting. I like exciting. Okay. So I'm going to say one, two, three, go. <laughs> Oh, wow. Let's look at all that. Now scrolling back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, taking some time to just take it in. Hmm. Rebecca, what do you think? Should we invite a voice to unmute? Maybe. Yes. Anybody feel like they want to share out for their group? There's so many good ones. Anybody brave enough to raise your hand and join us to share what you were thinking? Otherwise, we can call on somebody. Anyone? Um, 
Diane, would you mind sharing? I like how you organized yours, especially in the context of our convening today. Certainly, I would be happy to just remember this one voice is three voices. <laughs> um, let me see, Lupita and Sylvan and I had wonderful conversation. We initially shared fears because we're people, people, and uh, we don't want to lose that. And yet- Similar comments in our group as well. Yeah. And we recognize that there is a, a flow to the future that you can maybe disrupt things for a while, but it's futures, futures coming. And so then we got into talking about parents and families and their concerns and how important it is to bring them along in this because students are being exposed to wonderful new ideas and challenges and families aren't always a part of that. And we need them with us, like we need our business community, et cetera. And then we really talked about teacher education and how our universities and colleges need to be on board as well to prepare teachers for this future that we all recognize is here and are, are not always sure where it's going. I love that. Thank you for sharing. I think it's interesting how this conversation evolves because we saw a very similar pattern happen in our discussion group of you started looking at those skills, communication, teamwork, flexibility, those, those, and I, I like how Janine calls them human skills instead of soft skills, because it's true, right? Like there's nothing soft about them. That's really the core of what makes the world work. Um, but then it led automatically to a very common thread uh, is, as your group of how do we make sure we have the teacher workforce to accomplish this and do it productively? And then how do we make sure that parents are engaged in the conversation so it's successful? Um, Rochelle, you have your hand up too. See, I need technical skills. No, I just wanted to, Diane, thank you so much for that because it, it, it's, it's going to be such a shift almost for educators to, to release um, ownership mm -hmm. of a child's learning. Uh, uh, we shared, you know, we, we, in my group, we really talked about, uh, Craig said, agency. Kids know how they learn. They know what works for them. And, and sometimes we're so stuck in what we want to, what we want them to learn that we're not hearing and seeing how they're learning. So that's when I use authentic. I, I share, I have two grandsons, one, six, one, eight both real heady kids really up there, but they learn differently and, and they respond differently. So in the age that we're moving into, yes, there's some, there's some basic fundamental things like that brick wall I use. You, you've got to know masonry to be able to build the robotics to do the robotics mm -hmm. to build that brick wall. A surgeon has to know how to be a surgeon to be able to use the robotic arms to do what they need to do. But you can't be so heady that you can't express these new ideals that, that's coming in. So you have to teach them how to effectively communicate and how to work with people in different people. Yeah. So it all goes together, but we are the, mo we model that and we have to show that in our education. So it's reframing the way teachers are taught and the way they teach also. So thank you. That's the part sometimes we have it up here, but we don't say it out loud. Mm -hmm. And you saying it out loud would help it to flow down to the children that we're serving. That's, that's what I want to say. Thank you appreciate that so much and the opportunities that we have now and in this process to have these conversations that let us not just think about the skills or the values that we want, but the interconnectedness of that and the interconnected of all of us who care about student success um, makes such a huge impact. And so we appreciate you being part of this initial conversation and hope that y'all continue to join us. Yes, as we get ready to close out today, uh, you know, 
personally, when I was first introduced to Dr. Karen Mapp's dual capacity framework, I stepped back and said, this is just a powerful model to engage anybody <laughs> um, to be really thoughtful about the ways in which we try to implement any sort of important change initiative. And so um, it's one of it's something that's been a part of my work for a couple uh, a couple of years, um, even that when it wasn't explicitly about family engagement. But when we think about the focus of today and we think about that framework, um, you know, Rebecca, I'd love to kick it to you. Like, what needs to be considered as we engage families in this conversation of building a shared vision, so that they are a part of it and that they don't feel like it is another thing that is being done to them, which is something that a lot of people inside education are used to feeling. I think, you know, that's one of the things that I sit in a unique space where I'm often one of the only parents in a room full of educators or policymakers around education. And I think one of the big things I've found is that we need to be comfortable making sure that parents recognize their own expertise in the process. Mm -hmm. And that we honor the expertise that families bring to the discussion. Because also like myself and so many other parents, we have a life outside of being a parent, just like you have a life outside of being an educator. And when we honor the expertise that we all have, but then recognize what we don't necessarily share regarding knowledge or vocabulary so that we can then build upon the strengths in a way that each of us understand is I think so important because so often families struggle to accept education changes, not because they disagree with it, but because they don't understand what's happening. And it's because we're using terms and language, language that doesn't make sense outside of the educator space. I always call it edu speak. <laughs> and, and it's really fast to turn somebody off. And so when we recognize that each of us bring amazing expertise to the discussion, but we may not share a common language, even if we all speak English, then suddenly we can say, okay, there are things that we all agree on. And if you look at the conversations that happened today, each of us come from a different background and life story. And yet there were so many common links that we found. And when we see that opportunity, then parents can be champions instead of a challenge. And I find too often the education system treats parents as something that needs to be addressed versus a partner to champion work moving forward. That's my soapbox. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, I think that's <laughs> a lot. I feel like there's a lot of head nods in the room. And I think um, it's one of the reasons I was so grateful that you came on board to help co-facilitate and are helping us through this process as well, because we need, everyone has expertise. Young people have expertise, families do, educators do, our community does, um, and our system does too. And so there's, I think, an opportunity here. Uh, if we move slowly as we build trust, uh, as the framework really re requires us to be clear about relational trust and building that, um, that we can get to a place where we understand and, and we believe uh, enough of the same things that we're moving forward together. So I'm going to go ahead and just pop in the, uh, the chat real fast, nevadafutureoflearning.org, um, getting a preview of the website that's live for next week. Um, if, there are, if you are interested in being a part of the process, it kind of details it on page two. Uh, we'd love to have you fill out the form on page one. <laughs> and uh, as the updates occur, we'll be in touch with you. Um, but just thank you for your, your time, for this space. Thank you to the department. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for being an amazing facilitator. And thank you, Janine. I appreciate everybody being here today. Thank you for the conversations. It makes me better when I hear from you. Absolutely. Have a great day, everybody.